So very uh, briefly, um, Mike uh, is uh, actually the chief scientific advisor at the UK Department for International Trade. Uh, and uh, the job there is uh, helping drive some of the policy and putting the science behind the policy uh, that the, uh, the UK government has, uh, but also working uh, to understand how um, UK tech companies and technologies can uh, advise and work with cities around the world. Uh, Mike has a, quite a long career, um, mostly in the telecommunications space, um, spent a time at uh, Telefonica and O2, uh, and actively involved in uh, the GSM rollouts, uh, 2G and 3G, so uh, quite a strong technical background. Uh, Mike, I'm going to pass over to you. I'm going to pull up your slides because I, I think uh, you were hoping I was going to run those slides. So uh, if you want to just take over the mic and uh, I'll, uh, I'll show you slides. That's great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, speak before uh, UTA and this uh, City Trends event today. Uh, in my particular role as Chief Scientific Advisor, I thought I'd uh, just touch on a few of the areas of technology that are helping to make smart cities get smarter. And then after a few slides, maybe take a few questions at the end. Uh, so the role of Department of International Trade is very much to do with supporting exports from the UK, but also in, inbound investment to the UK. Clearly, it, it requires some uh, knowledge of the technology in many areas. So that's what I do from my, my, my role as Chief Scientific Advisor. Clearly, we remain a, a major in, inbound destination for international investment. Uh, we collaborate in many sectors, as you would expect for a country the size of the UK. And internationally, the area of smart cities is, is of particular interest. And in terms of how we do this, we clearly have uh, areas like a digital trade network in Asia Pacific that supports areas of digital technology. So whether you're based in Taiwan or other countries in the region, uh, we have uh, UK Department of International Trade officers who are there to support you with some of your needs, whether it be to collaborate with British companies or to uh, export to the UK, or indeed to uh, seek further collaboration with the country that they're based in. Uh, this is supported by a Tech Exporting Academy. It's also supported by various DIT staff in region and back in the UK, which helps the, helps the tech in engagement, whether it's around a city environment or whether it's around a, a particular sector. Um, our Secretary of State Liz Truss and Oliver Dowden recently said that technology must be front and centre for Britain in a post-Brexit world. And clearly some of the uncertainty around EU transition is one of the areas we deal with. But it doesn't stop innovative British companies from trading, whether it's in smart cities or in other sectors. We also have support from different regions within the UK for those who are investing into the UK. And we support a whole range of um, high potential opportunities for inbound investment as well as export. Some of our areas which we're more known for are areas like financial services and technology, but also we support some areas of investment finance. So when we look at technology, it's also been a steady driver for recovery. Uh, it's not just vaccines, for example. Uh, clearly, the UK has had a big hand in some of the, uh, the Oxford uh, designed vaccines uh, to, be, to be manufactured and distributed by AstraZeneca, for example. But apart from being a technology powerhouse in life sciences, uh, we've, we've given a lot of support in areas such as cybersecurity, in areas such as AI. And some of these have also been supported by various funds that we've made available. Some of them are, are smart city relevant, particularly when measuring air quality. Some of them are smart city relevant when man managing lockdowns during COVID. But technology is seen as a force for good and is really a, a force for change and innovation. These are some examples of some of the things during COVID that we've used uh, to fund uh, from the NHS or from other trade associations. So from the government, we put in place initially a 1.25 billion package to help firms with innovation to deal with coronavirus in its various forms, whether it's in the healthcare and life sciences arena, whether it's in the mobility of uh, staff and innovation, whether it's in areas to do with helping it bring the, uh, the, the recovery forward uh, where possible. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side a whole list of uh, one of the Tech Industry Association, Tech UK's uh, activities around response and how to help and supporting the business community. We also had uh, the National Health Service and their division called NHSX calling on all innovators who can support in areas such as AI and data analytics. I think also the UK um, stands high in terms of its place in the world, and, and these slides are available for you to use at, at your leisure offline, uh, should you wish. Uh, but we, we remain the number one uh, top scaling destination in Europe. 
in terms of tech startups. Uh, this applies because of some of the, the strong university pedigree we have in the UK, the strong R&D effort that we put in, in place across the UK uh, to support innovation. Uh, we can see huge numbers of unicorns, uh, some uh, large numbers continue to, to, to uh, emerge, and it, it stems from having a strong uh, capital base as well as a strong technology base in the UK. So we can see that we're, we're one of the leaders in terms of inbound destinations for investment, over 10.1 billion uh, in 2019. Uh, we can also see that we have more startups in the UK than probably France and Germany put together. And this, the, these are some raw numbers uh, which show that some of the venture capital investment continues to grow. It grew two and a half uh, times from 2015 to 2019 to 14 point, well, just over 14 billion. And this shows how some of that innovation is being sponsored and therefore supported in a much bigger way than, for, for example, other countries in Europe. We can also see that uh, we remain number one in terms of ranking for unicorns, uh, 79 by the end of uh, uh, th this particular chart, which is uh, to June 2020. Uh, and relative to other countries, you can see the ranking and many of the other uh, unicorns that have been listed since uh, Tech Week 2019. Tech Week took place in, in uh, September uh, this year. We can also see that venture capital uh, raises continue to be very strong, much more significant than Paris, Stockholm, Berlin and Tel Aviv combined, particularly in, in, in fintech, but in other areas such as enterprise software, energy and transportation. And for those with more of a smart city interest, clearly those, those innovations around uh, enterprise software, energy and transportation and cybersecurity are all relevant to the smart cities of today. Clearly, having the City of London uh, as a major investor centre is bound to attract lots of fintech, but there are some significant other smart city areas of relevance there. We can also see that uh, some of these tech companies are, are adjusting to a COVID-19 world. Lots of survey results that you can read at your own leisure. Many of them have pivoted in some ways to, to more of an online world, and, and that's starting to affect the centre of cities. So as we think about how e-commerce evolves, it may mean that people don't live so much in cities in the future, but certainly they want the added convenience of online shopping. We can also see a lot of startups that are in the uh, online healthcare area, and that's attracting a lot more attention. In terms of the uh, telecoms and connectivity world, which affects cities, there was a recent survey by the GSM Association that I used to be chairman of, and they looked at eight areas uh, and surveyed them in April this year. And uh, this looked at some of the major mobile operators globally, and there were some good survey responses. But of the eight areas that uh, were counted as significant during COVID, four of them were felt to have a long-lasting effect, and that's network capacity, particularly with the shift from cities to rural or semi-rural semi areas. Uh, security was felt to be an area of future investment because of the particular need for added security in an online world. A lot more invent, in, intention to invest in data collaboration and analytics. This has been useful when analyzing the COVID crisis. So data analytics, I'm sure, will continue to be important for, for managing smart cities. But the operators are there to help in that area. And a big push towards much more telehealth and telemedicine, uh, where they could see more interest in, in an online world, particularly during COVID. They also updated some of their 5G forecasts, so some of the investment in the fifth generation of mobile, uh, they'd already had a forecast previously of around 1.8 billion. Uh, this forecast was revised in, in spring of this year to around 1.7 billion. In other words, a fast growth rate, but slightly slower at the beginning. Uh, slightly slower because uh, the ability to install and build new 5G networks was inhibited by the COVID crisis. But it's still a growth industry. Also, 5G is not just bringing higher speeds and more capability, but it's bringing also more capacity and lower latency and more capability. And these are all important issues for smart cities. When we think about the cities of the future, they are bound to be more connected, but also uh, going to be better supported, uh, whether it be for driverless cars in those cities or whether it be for connecting sensors, the Internet of Things certainly is expected to have a massive growth um, requirement in terms of capacity. So measured cities or smart cities have to be connected. And this additional capacity and capability with 5G really helps. If we also look at the area of e-commerce, which is very important for all of us, clearly it's growing. The UK happens to have a, a really strong capability in the e-commerce space. 
Uh, and we can see from this particular slide that not only are we the, the third largest e-commerce in the uh, market in the world, but, but it's also widely spread across many types of products and services, whether it's 60% of clothes being bought in 2018 online or 49% of household goods, or even 44% of holiday accommodation. Clearly, where capability does exist in a connected world, one can actually use it for best effect in e-commerce. And we have significant strengths there. UK surpassed something like 200 billion euros uh, in 2018 and can, has continued to grow even more rapidly during this uh, particular COVID year of 2020. Mobile money, I think, is also an international phenomenon where the UK had a, a pivotal hand in its invention some 15 years ago. So the, the, the secure SMS or secure messaging routes which have allowed the transfer of money from A to B. This is particularly useful in parts of Africa and South Asia, where maybe the banking system is not as universal as we know in our countries of, of the UK or, or other countries of Europe. Also, it's very useful when it comes to not just remittances from, from abroad, so sending money home from uh, uh, maybe a destination back home, but, it, but it's also starting to be used for paying of utility bills and preparing for mobile health payments and, and really transacting huge volumes, such that it says there $1.9 billion processed daily last year, but over a billion uh, mobile money subscriptions. And this is being seen in many countries in the world as really being a great enabler for making cities smarter, as well as economies more efficient. Uh, I often get asked about education. The UK has some really strong professional institutions and educational links, but this uh, chemistry type table gives the flavor of some of the online e-learning that is now taking place. I don't propose to go through this in full, but it's a capability we, we regularly get asked about, whether it be for university students, whether it be for, for online learning uh, in a continuous education type way, or even lifelong learning. Many of these areas of, of education and learning are vital to all our industries. When we look more at cities though, I think we can see a whole range of technologies, which we typically call geospatial technology, applying. And that's because we, we don't necessarily think there's one technology that can do everything. Uh, there's a whole range shown here, as you can see with the, with the eight columns. And it's split into areas like current, emerging and future, because some of these technologies are changing very fast, but we need to acknowledge that there are some other technologies coming down the pipeline. We can also acknowledge that in a city, it's often uh, not a smart city that is purchased by a customer. It's usually areas to do with point solutions, such as technologies as listed here, or even point solutions for the services that the city should offer. So we often get questions to say, how can you help with transport planning or congestion? Or how can you help with energy management? Or how can you help with water and waste management? And these technologies shown here are geospatial in nature, but they often match those services that may be in a smart city and match them in terms of capability. So we can imagine the cameras and imaging and sensing. That is absolutely vital to get right in any city for any areas to do with smart traffic management. It's also very helpful when it comes to security so balancing those issues of smart traffic management with security are key. If we also want to imagine congestion, we can start to now imagine it from above, such as using unmanned vehicle systems or drones. We can start to use some surveying and measurement and scanning equipment to look at the movement of people as well as vehicles. Clearly areas like artificial intelligence depend on the data that is available. So thinking about data stores, the London data store is a, a fantastic example where lots of data has been stored and been the basis for lots of innovation. But a lot of it is being applied in, in the form of apps or aggregating data with artificial intelligence. We can start to see innovation around data stores really picking up. We can also see that the smart sensors that may fit a city may be linked to the Internet of Things, but sensing a city so that one knows what the air quality is or what the movement flow is can really be managed very carefully with more and more smart sensors. We can see how, how cities of the future can be visualized with digital twins or immersive technologies. We can also simulate cities and transport in very significant ways, but it does depend on the data and making sure that the simulation is impactful. And last but not least, this would not work unless there was better connectivity between the different technologies and, and indeed between the different sources of data. 
So I think there's a whole range of opportunities there with a technology lens, but often it needs to be applied to the individual city services, whether it's transport or energy or water and waste, or even crime and security. It needs to be applied rather than it being um, a city only solution. It needs to be applied to the services the city needs and the citizens will value. We also have seen significant innovation around healthcare, and uh, I believe that we need to be thinking about healthy cities, not just uh, smart cities. That starts to think about some of the technologies that may be available. So UK companies such as Graphcore, which are involved with chip design to help speed up the flow and, and uh, flow of data, whether it be for x-rays or other services. Uh, we recently uh, supported a company called VST Enterprises that have something called CoviPass that's specializing in cybersecurity in the healthcare area. And uh, pleased to see Card Medic, which is a, a relatively young SME, founded within the NHS, which is now being used with digital flashcards for deaf, blind, and critically, critically ill uh, CV, uh, COVID-19 patients. And there are many uh, health systems as well. Uh, we're about to produce a directory of 100 uh, digital health startups, uh, which is already getting quite a lot of interest within the NHS. Most of them are being used by the National Health Service in the UK already, and many of them are now ready for export. In terms of the environment, I think we also know that the UK is hosting uh, COP26, the climate change talks next year in Glasgow in, in November. And we're very pleased to say that we have lots of solutions that uh, have emerged in recent times, whether they be AI based or robotics based or Internet of Things based. These are just some examples of some of the solutions which are necessary when we think about the environment and clean tech. The smart cities, I think there's a, a very high interest uh, in areas such as air quality and air quality and the weather are interdependent. So I'm sure air quality will be part of the COP26 talks next year as well. And if we look at UK strengths, um, I've tried to give more of a technology overview, but I think what we have is four of the top universities in the world, R&D capabilities second to none. Um, we clearly have huge innovative startups and SMEs as evidenced by the earlier figures. We actually have over 200 incubators and accelerators in the UK across the UK supporting many areas of technology, many areas of startups which are ready for scale up. We've clearly got excellent networks and professional institutions to support us. Uh, so, some countries would really uh, kill us to have the same sort of capability and depth, but really strong in areas of advanced technology. And whether it's advanced for a city or whether it's advanced for a vertical sector, uh, we can usually pick out some really strong candidates in those areas. We've had traditionally very strong access to investment and funding. The City of London is re really strong in terms of its reach and frankly, a very open business environment. The benefit of the English language an open business environment and a strong legal system. And it's all supported by a strong R&D community and supportive taxation and R&D policies. And generally, when we put all that together, it makes for a really strong innovation uh, ecosystem. Uh, we've recently been listed fourth in the Global Innovation Index, uh, and that's tantamount to measuring this on an international country by country basis. But it also means that we need to collaborate to make sure scale can be achieved internationally. And uh, that, that is no different for the world of smart cities. I'm very happy to share all the slides uh, with you that are here. Uh, I've run through them very quickly, hopefully to leave time for, for questions. Uh, but on behalf of the Department of International Trade, thank you for giving me the opportunity and very happy to take questions.